Everybody will come to order. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's hearing on the posture of the U.S. Strategic Command and the U.S. Pacific Command. Unfortunately, we still don't have a budget from the President, and sequestration has now taken effect. But this committee intends to move ahead with our annual posture hearings to ensure there are no gaps in the committee's oversight. With that in mind, I'd like to thank our two witnesses for agreeing to be the first to testify in our posture hearing lineup. With us today, we have General C. Robert Kaler, the Commander of U.S. Strategic Command, and Admiral Samuel L. Locklear, the Commander of U.S. Pacific Command. General Kaler, I know you have many different hats that you wear, from missile defense to cyber to nuclear deterrence. I'm deeply troubled about what, what sequestration means to these areas of responsibility, which pose ex existential challenges to this nation. I also am very concerned by the direction the President wants to go in driving further U.S. nuclear reductions at the present time. I understand the President has been considering a new nuclear guidance document that will seek to reduce our nuclear forces even further. If that is in fact the case, nothing has been shared with this committee. Furthermore, it's not clear to me why this is necessary. It certainly does nothing to deal with threats like North Korea or Iran. As for Russia, why would we believe we can trust Vladimir Putin to honor new arms control agreements when he has shown a consistent willingness to violate current arms control agreements, when he denies visas to members of this body to travel to Russia, and when he uses adoptive children as props in his neo-nationalism? I'm especially concerned and suspicious when the President appears to be attempting to avoid the Senate and the Congress in getting such an agreement. Without a formal ratified treaty, any agreement will inherently be non-binding. We know the Russians will violate such an agreement as they did when we tried this in the early 1990s. General Kaler, understanding that you must support your chain of command, today I hope to explore further why additional reductions are in our best interest, especially since we no longer have a production capacity. Admiral Locklear, it's been over a year since the President released the Defense Strategic Guidance and outlined the rebalancing to Asia. I'm concerned about recent developments in Asia and how PACOM is postured to respond to a crisis. North Korea's threats and their nuclear and missile programs continue unabated. China's dangerous actions in the South and East China Seas pose a threat to our regional allies and partners, to U.S. national security interests, and to the sea la la lines of communication that are vital to global economic stability. This committee will continue to ask for more details on what the rebalancing means and how we can hope to deliver on the new strategy in light of other operational demands and lack of resources. I want to thank you both again for being with us here today. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to thank our uh, witnesses, General Keller, Admiral Locklear. appreciate you being here today and appreciate your service to our country. I think the greatest challenge is the one that the chairman outlined, uh, how do you continue to carry out your missions and your plans in light of sequestration. You know, built a strategy based on a certain budget, and now that budget is dramatically different. And it's not just sequestration, it is the lack of an appropriations bill for the first five months of this fiscal year, and, and perhaps longer, depending on what happens in the next weeks ahead. It is very difficult for you gentlemen to do your job when you don't know exactly how much money you're going to have and when that changes from month to month. We in Congress need to pass appropriations bills um, for all discretionary spending, not just defense, uh, to make it easier to govern and make those decisions. In light of that, I think the most interesting thing that we have to talk about this morning is how that impacts the plans, particularly in Asia, uh, where we made you know much talk about the pivot to Asia, the focus on its importance, which I think is perfectly appropriate. Um, it is a region of enormous importance that we should um, be focusing intently on, uh, building as many positive relationships in that region as we can. Understand that the Pacific Command is a very important piece of that. Um, I think in 2011 or 
2012, I forget which, there were over 700 port calls that were done uh, by our Navy throughout the Asian theater. That is a way to build relationships and part of that effort uh, to build the partnerships we need there. I want to know how that process is going um, and how sequestration challenges it. And then, of course, specifically uh, the threat of North Korea and the impact that that has on the region. Uh, in strategic command, there are also obviously a number of challenges, starting with our nuclear arsenal. You know, what what is the purpose and mission of that arsenal? What do the numbers need to be uh, to meet the requirements that we have? I personally think that it is very appropriate um, some, gosh, over 20 years after the Cold War to continue to reexamine, you know, what size of a nuclear arsenal we need when we're making difficult budget decisions. What are our most important national security objectives? Are there ways to find savings uh, within the nuclear arsenal? I believe that there are. Um, and I'm anxious to hear more about how we implement that. And then, of course, the incredible importance of missile defense. Um, we've seen its impact in the Middle East. Uh, we know the threat that is rising from Iran and North Korea. Uh, how do we posture our forces and invest in missile, de missile defense technology to best meet those threats, um, again, within the tight budget constraints that we have? So I look forward to the testimony, the questions from the members. I thank you both for being here, uh, for your service to our country, and I thank the chairman for holding this meeting. With that, I yield back. Thank you. General Kaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If it's, uh, if it's uh, permissible with you, I'd like to make my full statement a part of the record. Without objection, both your full statements will be in the record. Thank you, sir. So ordered. And good morning uh, to you, uh, Ranking Member Smith, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I'm certainly honored to join with all of you today. It's a privilege to begin my third year leading the outstanding men and women of United States Strategic Command. I'm also pleased to be here with Admiral Sam Locklear, a great colleague whose responsibilities as Commander of Pacific Command cover some of the most critical areas and issues on the globe. Pacific Command and Strategic Command are the closest of partners. Admiral Locklear and I collaborate frequently, and I greatly value his leadership, vision, and counsel. Uncertainty and complexity continue to dominate the national security landscape, even as the United States transitions from a decade of active conflict in Southwest Asia. Uncertainty and complexity make this transition unlike any we have experienced in the past. Many regions of the world remain volatile, and increasing economic and information connections mean regional issues can quickly have global consequences. Events over the past year validate this perspective. Since my last appearance before the committee, we have seen violent extremists continue to act against or threaten U.S. interests, citizens, allies, partners, and our homeland. Cyber activities increased in both quantity and intensity, with the potential for greater exploitation of U.S. intellectual property, institutions, and critical infrastructure. Iran's nuclear ambitions remain concerning. North Korea conducted a missile launch in violation of its obligations under multiple U.N. Security Council resolutions and announced last month it conducted another nuclear test. Civil war continues in Syria, Russia, and China continue to improve and demonstrate their strategic capabilities. Fiscal uncertainty is adding additional unique challenges. Not only are the additional sequestration reductions steep, but the law allows little flexibility in how to apply them, and we're also working from a continuing resolution while transitioning contingency needs to the base budget. This during a time when continued readiness is essential, modernization is overdue, violent extremists remain active, threats in space and cyberspace are increasing, and the possibility of nuclear and ballistic missile proliferation persists. As we confront these challenges, our enemies and potential enemies are watching. In this uncertain and complex world, STRATCOM remains focused on conducting the missions that are most critical to protect our core national security interests. My priorities support this focus. Our fundamental purpose remains constant. With the other combatant commands, we must deter, detect, and prevent attacks against the United States, assure our friends and allies of our security commitments to them, and, if directed, employ appropriate force to achieve national objectives should deterrence fail. To do this, our men and women wield a range of complementary capabilities to create the tailored effects the nation needs. Our primary objective is to prevent conflict by influencing in advance the perceptions, assessments, and decisions of those who would consider threatening our vital national interests. Ultimately, this requires the continuing credibility of America's military capabilities brought to bear in concert with other elements of national power. While our heritage is nuclear, 
and our nuclear vigilance will never waver as long as those weapons exist, STRATCOM's activities today are far more diverse and versatile. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to report that STRATCOM is capable of executing its assigned mission responsibilities today. However, given the potential impact fiscal uncertainty and declining resources could have on STRATCOM, I am concerned that I may not be able to say the same in six months or a year. I am most concerned with the impact financial uncertainty is having on our people. Uniformed and non-uniformed members alike have managed the effects of sustained, high-stress combat deployment and operational tempos. They willingly take personal risk for their country, but they are fearful of taking financial risk for their families. Hiring restrictions, salary freezes, and the likelihood of unpaid furloughs are especially troubling to our civilians. Civilians comprise about 60% of the STRATCOM headquarters staff. They hold key leadership positions. They represent critical expertise and they represent much of the essential workforce which, pro which provides crucial functions like intelligence, maintenance, and sustainment. Because they are such dedicated patriots, I believe our military and civilian members will cope with the effects of financial uncertainty in the near term. But I worry that over time, our most experienced professionals will retire early and our best young people will leave to pursue more stable opportunities elsewhere. We are detecting hints of that now. Beyond the human dimension, sequestration will eventually impact the command's readiness and curtail growth in new areas like cyber defense. Even though the services are trying to give STRATCOM's missions as much priority treatment as possible within the law, we could not remain immune. So while the immediate impact will vary by command, overall in STRATCOM, the effect is like an avalanche. Seemingly small initial impacts are going to grow. As time passes, we will see greater impacts to the nuclear deterrent, global strike, missile warning and missile defense, situational awareness in both space and cyberspace, and to our support for warfighters around the globe. In the longer term, continuing on this financial path will affect STRATCOM's modernization and long-term sustainment needs, potentially eliminating or jeopardizing a number of important recapitalization efforts. Ultimately, reduced readiness and curtailed modernization will damage the perceived credibility of our capabilities increasing the risk to achieving our primary deterrence and assurance objectives. Mr. Chairman, STRATCOM's responsibilities have not changed, but the strategic and fiscal environment in which we must carry them out is much different than a year ago. I remain enormously proud of the superb men and women I am privileged to lead and convinced we can meet our mission responsibilities today. But the pathway we're on creates growing risk to our defense strategy and our ability to execute it. I look forward to working with this committee and Congress on these difficult and complex challenges and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral Lockler. Good morning, Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Smith, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today and provide you with my perspectives from the U.S. Pacific Command. For the past 12 months, I've had the great honor to lead over 328,000 service members and 38,000 civilian employees along with their families. Uh, our area of responsibility is diverse and extremely complex, stretching from California to India. The Indo-Asia Pacific encompasses over half the Earth's surface and well over half its population. The region is culturally, socially, economically, and geopolitically diverse. The nations of the Indo-Asia Pacific include five of our nation's seven treaty allies three of the largest and seven of the ten smallest economies. The most populated nations in the world, including the largest Muslim-majority nation, the largest democracy, and the world's smallest republic. The Indo-Asia Pacific is the engine that drives the global economy. The open accessible sea lanes throughout the Asia-Pacific annually enjoy over $8 trillion in bilateral trade with one-third of the world's bulk cargo and two-thirds of the oil shipments sailing to and from nine of the world's ten largest economic ports, which are in this part of the world. By any meaningful measure, the Indo-Asia Pacific is also the world's most militarized region, with seven of the ten largest standing armies, the world's largest and most sophisticated navies, and five of the world's declared nuclear armed nations. Now, when taken all together, these aspects represent a region with a unique strategic complexity and a wide, diverse group of challenges that can significantly 
stress the overall security environment. Effectively engaging in the Indo-Asia Pacific requires a committed and sustained effort, and U.S. PACOM, as a military component of this commitment, is focused in our efforts to deter aggression, assure our allies and our partners, and to prevent should our national interests be threatened. While the Indo-Asia Pacific today is relatively at peace, I am concerned by a number of security challenges that have the possibility to impact the security environment. Examples include climate change, where increasing, increasingly severe weather patterns and rising sea levels, along with inevitable earthquakes and tsunamis and super typhoons and massive flooding, threaten today and will continue to threaten populations in the future in this region. Transnational non-state threats will persist, which include pandemics, pirates, terrorists, criminal organizations as well as drugs, human trafficking, and of course, weapons of mass destruction. Historic and emerging border and territorial disputes will no doubt continue. Access and freedom of action in the shared domains of sea, air, space, and cyberspace are being challenged. Competition for water, food, and energy will grow. Instability on the Korean Peninsula will persist. The rise of China and India as global economic powers and their emergence as regional military powers will continue. And finally, recognition of the fact that no single organizational mechanism exists in the Indo-Asia Pacific to manage relationships and when needed to provide a framework for conflict resolution. Simply put, there is no Pacific NATO. The U.S. Joint Force has been heavily tasked in other AORs over the past decade, and as a consequence, the U.S. PACOM AOR in many key areas has been resource challenged and has assumed additional risk. Our rebalance to the Pacific strategy has given us a new opportunity to begin to solve these challenges and reemphasize to our allies and our partners that we are a committed Pacific nation. It also reflects the recognition that the future prosperity of the U.S will be defined largely by events and developments in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Over the past year, the rebalance has helped focus our planning and our resource decisions as we work closer with our allies and our partners to ensure a security environment favorable to U.S. interests. However, the impacts of sequestration and the realities of continuing resolutions have created significant budget uncertainties, limited our flexibility to manage, and have the potential to undermine our strategic rebalance momentum as our ability to operate and maintain our force is at increased risk. Nonetheless, U.S. PACOM will continue to work with services to preserve, to the extent possible, our essential homeland defense and crisis response capabilities, capabilities which are resident in many of our forward deployed forces. The Pacific Ocean does not separate us from Asia. It connects us. We're connected by our economies, by our cultures, by our shared interest, and by our security challenges. We have been resource challenged and accepting risk in the Indo-Asia Pacific region for some time, but our rebalance strategy is in place and we are making good progress. Let me assure you that U.S. PACOM will continue to demonstrate to our allies, our partners, and others the U.S.'s resolve and commitment to peace and security in this important part of the world. On behalf of our superb military and civilian members, and their families who sacrifice every day to ensure that our country is well defended, I'd like to thank each member of the committee for your support. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You know, we, um, we are cutting from our defense budget this year. Uh, last year, our number was $550 billion. This year, after sequestration, it's $501 billion. The OCO number last year was $122 billion. This year, after sequestration, $88.5 billion. So we're cutting this year out of our national security, our defense budget, over $80 billion. Very significant. I have an article uh, before me that says that China this year <clears throat> plans to raise its defense budget by 10.7 percent or 115.7 billion dollars. They're raising theirs 115, we're cutting ours 
over 80. I think that is uh, something that all of us on this committee need to pay attention to, need to understand the significance of. We will have the opportunity this week uh, in the House to vote for a continuing resolution which will fund the government through the end of this fiscal year, 930. Wrapped in that um, budget, or in that CR, will be a defense appropriations bill. Now this committee last year completed our National Defense Authorization Act. We went through the process. We held the hearings such as we're holding here today. We passed a bill through this, these subcommittees, through this full committee, and on the House of the floor with a very good vote. The Senate, while it took them a little longer, did get their work done and did pass their bill in December of last year. We conferenced, we had a very short time to do it, but we came out with a bill, we passed it, it was signed by the President of the United States. That bill has no effect unless the appropriations bill is passed. They, the appropriators, have also done their work. They held their hearings. They passed it on the floor, passed in the Senate. They have worked jointly to do this. They followed regular order, and because of that, it's part of this CR. They're the only uh, committee that's done that. I think that, that we could probably find reasons to vote against that bill. But I think every member of this committee should understand the importance of getting that passed <clears throat> and the benefit it will have to at least take away some of the sting of sequestration on our military by giving them the authority to spend money on more important areas than they're having to do if they become just part of a CR without the appropriation bill. So I urge all the members of this committee to really look at that and understand the responsibility we have in protecting the national defense of this nation. Now, General Kaler, Admiral Locklear, the, sequestr the sequestration deadline passed on Friday. You're still operating at this point under a continuing resolution. How are the current fiscal restraints that you're operating under, how do they impact your plan to execute uh, your missions today, six months from now, a year from now. I'd like you to please be specific. Has your ability to respond to a crisis been impacted? And what are not you able to do today or any longer because of these conditions you're operating under? General? Mr. Chairman, I would uh, make a couple of setup points here. First, because of the nature of the combatant commands, I think that the immediate impacts of, of General, could you move that mic just a little closer? Yes, sir. Is that better? Thank you, sir. I, I because the nature of the of the impact will be different from command to command. Let me just describe that that. And I think it's important that the committee knows this. I think it's important that any potential adversaries know this. Strategic Command is capable of performing its full range of missions today. Uh, we're four days, I guess, uh, past the, the time that sequestration began. And uh, as I sit here and look for the coming months, I do not see um, a, a dramatic impact on our ability to accomplish our mission. But as I said in my opening remarks, what will happen is that as the service chiefs have struggled with how to apply these, these various financial rules that they've been given, they have uh, had to go to some places to take cuts that eventually are going to impact us. Uh, flying hours, for example. Uh, in the near term, what the Air Force is going to try to do is um, take their flying hours in the bomber force, for example, in such a way as to make sure that our crews that are nuclear certified will remain so for as long as possible. But eventually, those, if, if unaddressed, those issues will persist. And then those impacts will begin to be felt in strategic command. 
there are other impacts that, that are, we've seen out of potential moves that the services have had to make. Uh, we could see eventually um, impact of the reduction of uh, maintenance or the deferral of maintenance, for example. Eventually that will impact the forces that are assigned to strategic command. Again, I think the services are trying as best they can within the rules that they have to, to give us in some of these critical places some priority treatment. Um, if, in fact, we have to continue with some curtailment of operations of sensors, for example, eventually that will impact space situational awareness. Those are the kind of things that I can't sit here today, Mr. Chairman, and say today we have we have had a dramatic impact on either our readiness or ability to perform our missions. That I would be mischaracterizing where we stand today. But I don't want to understate the impact of what is coming to us. And I believe that, that other commands uh, would probably have a different assessment of, of where they stand today. I am concerned that as time passes, uh, that, that this, as I say, I, I, the best um, the best way that I can describe this is it's an avalanche. It, it, it begins very small in strategic command, and then it begins to cascade as the momentum builds. That, those are the issues that we are, are most concerned about, is because we can't see clearly yet the way forward. We know that some of these impacts are coming. I can't tell you exactly what those are going to be or when. The other issue that I think is, is a big one for me personally is the issue of the impact that all of the uncertainty is having on our, on our members, and in particular the civilians, as I said. I think that they, they are being asked to, to sacrifice much here, uh, and I think we need to be mindful of that. Uh, we have an intern program that one of my predecessors started, uh, where we go to universities and we try to bring interns in with the hopes that they'll come to government service. Uh, we've, been some, we've had some success with this, especially in those technical areas that, that STRATCOM is reliant on. We've had a number of those new government employees, college graduates, come to their supervisors in the last several months and, and question whether this, this is a future for them. Uh, so I, I don't want to overstate that either, but I don't want to under, understate. I think there's a human dimension to this that we need to be mindful of, and I can't characterize that as an impact on readiness. But, but we have, our people are, are concerned about all of this. Uh, the final thing that I would say is I can't characterize either the potential impact on investment because those decisions haven't been made. Again, the services are struggling with those kinds of impacts. What I can say, I believe, from STRATCOM's portfolio of capabilities is all, I am certain that everything that's in STRATCOM's portfolio will be on the table when we make those decisions. So I'd like to be able to be more crisp today with specifics of the impact. I can't give you that. I just know that the readiness impacts are coming if undressed. And I know that there's an impact in the way our people are, the discomfort level uh, with our people. I can't tell you yet what's happening with investment because I just don't know what the department's going to decide yet in terms of uh, uh, reprioritizing and all the things that go with that. If that helps you, sir. We, we understand that the, um, that the chiefs had a year to work on the $487 billion and to really plan where they would cut the, and the sequestration they were basically ordered not to plan. So I, we understand the, uh, how those decisions haven't been made yet and it's going to take some time to, uh, to do that. And we understand how each combatant commander has different uh, it will impact them differently. So when we get through this whole process of listening to all of you, then we'll have a little bit better picture ourselves as we move forward on uh, into the subcommittee, subcommittee hearings and, and put our bill together. Admiral, I, I don't want you to, uh, to telegraph any weaknesses that we, that we may have. So if you can understand that you know how to answer the question, so that we get a, a general understanding without knowing specifics that we can discuss in, in open session like this. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, first, I think uh, the Pacific Ocean is the largest object in the world. It's the largest thing on the Earth. You could take every landmass in the world and you could put them all together and fit them in the Pacific Ocean and still have room for an African continent 
and a North American continent. And I think sometimes, um, at least people here in my hometown, they don't recognize that. They don't recognize the vast distances. Uh, they don't see the impacts of American interest here. It, it doesn't, it's not, doesn't show up. It doesn't, they don't understand that all the goods and services, many of them come across this vast oceans through other economies that make our economy vibrant. So one of the things that has enabled that over the last 70 years has been the presence of U.S. military forces in this part of the world that have provided really quite a remarkable presence and security that allowed the rise of these large nations, large democracies, uh, in a peaceful way that has fueled our own economy and, and helped our quality of life, and will continue to do so for the next, uh, for the future. So, with that, con in in that context, there's there's three things that that I do as a combatant commander that I have to look at the impacts of resources because I'm the I'm the end user from the services as they push things out to me in this vast region. The, the first thing I'd have to do is what is the impact on our ability to, to deter. And there are significant deterrence issues here. Uh, today, we're deterring a, a North Korea that, uh, that you see through all the rhetoric and all of the, the provocations have occurred that this is not getting better. Uh, we are deterring to ensure that a security environment is, is consistent through the coming decades and not one that leads us to, to, to any kind of conflict in this very militarized part of the world. The second thing I do is I assure. Now, we only have seven allies in the world, seven treaty allies. Five of them are in my AOR. Uh, the other two are NATO, and I think the Rio, uh, Rio is the other one. So they're really the five nations that are our allies are here. And we have the, the, our, our relationship with Thailand goes back to 180 years. It's the first, first ally we have. And these alliances have underpinned our security and our security strategy and our economic strategy, I think, in this part of the world for many decades. And so assuring those alliances that the U.S. is committed to our commitment to the alliance and that they're committed to us as well uh, takes presence, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes exercising, it takes relationship, capacity building, those types of things. And then the third thing that I worry most about is preventing. So let's say that all the good things we do to, uh, to try to ensure the security environment remains stable, if somehow that fails, I'm accountable to you and to the American people and to the President to be able to say that I can defend U.S. citizens and U.S. interests in my half of the world. It's 52 percent of the world in, in the PACOM AOR. So we rely very heavily on forward deployed forces, forward, forward station forces, uh, the ability to rotate forces effectively that are well trained into the theater in a way that allows me to accomplish those three things. So what, what are the near-term uh, impacts? Well, first, we'll start to see the readiness uh, accounts uh, be, because that's the only place the service chiefs can go, um, really the only place they have the, the uh, flexibility to, to, to find near-term savings, is they'll take that out of things like flying hour programs. So the airplanes that I need to put on the carriers that need to come forward or that go into my, to my fighter rotations in theater will not be trained and may not come. We will not deploy ships. Uh, we were just, uh, just sitting in my front porch in Hawaii two days ago, and there's a, there's a ship sitting there that was supposed to deploy uh, early the, the first day of this month, and it hasn't gone. And it hasn't gone because the operating dollars to send it forward to do the three things that I just said for you to do will not be available. Um, similarly, you could apply that across all, all aspects of, of whether my exercise programs have been truncated. Just to my headquarters alone, uh, one of the things, because I'm in Hawaii, I have a, about a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a staff that is required to be out and active in 35 nations to do, the, to do the things that we've been asked to do. My travel budget, I immediately cut it by 50 percent. So we're 50 we're percent effective today just because we had to cut that. And that's a small thing, but it gives you an indication of the kind of the near-term impacts. The long-term, well, just as uh, General Kaler said, it's going to be like an avalanche. Uh, it's going to compound. Um, uh, you know, the, the dis bad decision we make today just ends up in three or four more down the road because of the way our force is structured, because of the way we deploy our force from our homeland. And pulling those dollars out will ultimately result in less capacity for, uh, for my AOR. 
it also uh, will ultimately, if allowed to, undermine the rebalance. Now, the rebalance strategy, uh, I don't think any, I've never found anybody disagreed with it. It was, it was clear that the American people looked at it, I looked at it, I think all of y'all did and said, you know, for the next uh, century, uh, for our children and our grandchildren, we have to get it right in the Asia Pacific. And that <clears throat> after several decades of war in the Middle East, that we, where we have <clears throat> maybe prioritized our, our efforts there, and we have to look at, uh, had to look more closely at the Asia Pacific. And a big piece of that is how we uh, ensure uh, and put our military uh, in, a, in a footing in the, in the, in the, uh, Asia, in the Indo-Asia Pacific that does the three things that I talked about. So uh, we have a plan for rebalance. You know, since the last year when I saw you all a year ago, uh, we worked diligently to try to put things into place, but they're not all going to happen overnight. Uh, the road we're on will undermine that. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could follow up on that a little bit, Admiral, talking about our you know, pivot to Asia and some of the efforts ongoing their relationship with China. First thing I do want to clarify, the Chairman said that the Chinese budget had gone up 10 percent, which is true, but I think it also sort of implied that it had gone up by $115 billion. It didn't go up by that much. Best estimates are that the Chinese defense budget is somewhere between 120 and 180 billion, not over a trillion. Uh, granted, that's difficult to calculate, um, but you know, let's round up and say it's 200 billion. That's still you know a little over 350 billion less than we're spending this year. So, from a money standpoint, you know, we, we ought to be able to compete. It's a matter of how we make the decisions going forward. Um, can you talk a little bit about the as part of the Asia pivot? There have been troop movements. Um, the effort, to, the ongoing effort to try to figure out our Marines on Okinawa, working with J the Japanese government, how many were going to move to Guam, um, how many were going to move elsewhere. What's the latest on that? It's sort of been stalled by the fact that the Japanese, you know, want us to move from Futema, um, but they have yet to actually put in place um, the other spot on Okinawa where we're supposed to move to, when that's sort of been making it difficult uh, to make those decisions. So an update on that. And then also, how are things going in Australia with our, you know, rotational placement there um, and how the Australian government and the Australian people are reacting to that? And then um, just a little bit more about the importance of partnership building as part of our strategy, that it's not just a matter of us having, you know, this huge, enormous presence, but it's a matter of building allies uh, in the Asian theater that we can work with. How is that going? So I guess there's three pieces to that. You know, one, our troop movements, two, Australia in particular, and then three, uh, other allies and how that's developing. Yes, sir, let me uh, start by talking about troop movements. Uh, before I talk about Okinawa and Fatima specifically, as, as, an, as an obvious signal of the rebalance already, uh, I think I would like to comment that, uh, that the First Corps, which is a large army unit up in the northwest, which has been aligned uh, to the Middle East for a better part of a decade have now been realigned under PACOM and are under me and are now we're planning uh, for their activities in the in the Pacific uh, theater uh, here so I think that's significant three MEF uh, which has largely been out of the Pacific area for the last uh, Marine Expeditionary Force for the last uh, decade or so has now returned to the Pacific and they're they are out and about and doing their traditional role in, in deterring, assuring, and preventing uh, in their amphibious operations. So that's a, a good sign that we're making some headway in the rebalance. Uh, on the issue of o o Okinawa, the, 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 the underlying reasons that we did this are still sound. Uh, the relate, the, the uh, agreement that we've had with the, uh, with the, the, the government of Japan uh, remains, I think, in uh, in a forward progress uh, mode at this point in time. Uh, we uh, plan, as far as the, the troop movements, I think you've been briefed on on the most recent ones, but uh, that movement would entail about, um, uh, I think, just a little under 5,000 returning to Guam, uh, probably about 27 at some point in time around the time 2025, 2026, coming to Hawaii. Um, the uh, the issue of the Fatima had been we disconnected that from the troop movements so that it, it because it was just slowing us down too much, um, but uh, there is progress in that regard too. Uh, I believe that the uh, 
the government of Japan will, will sometime in the very near future pass the uh, EIS uh, statements to, to the Okinawans and then ask for them to move forward on, on the permits to be able to begin uh, their reconstruction of the Fatima facility. Okay. So I think we're on, on track on that, uh, and I believe that uh, it's a rational, the, the entire thing is a very rational strategy for the way I see the Pacific uh, uh, pay, PACOM AOR and the proper positioning of our forces for the future, not necessarily for the past. I think it's a good step. Uh, Australia figures in that equation well. We have finished our very successful first rotation of about 250 Marines. I visited them about a month and a half ago in Darwin. Uh, there's uh, some magnificent training ranges there. Uh, we have very fine uh, partners uh, with, and allies with the Australians. Uh, the um, response from the, the, both the uh, political and the local population has been very positive. They've been uh, good citizens. We'll do another 250 rotation this year uh, with the hopes that we would expand that to about 1,000 next year. Now, keep in mind, these are rotational forces. They're only in there for about five or six months out of the year. Uh, we're not building a base. We're not building any more U.S. bases in the, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, we're using our partnership and capacity issues to, to allow the Australians to assist us and help us here. It doesn't mean it's free, uh, but it does mean that uh, we're using that uh, to a great degree. And I think that um, these uh, Marines will now, uh, during the five or six months that they're not now there on, in Australia training, they will be out and about. They'll provide me a better flexibility and contingency forces that are ready to do the type respond to anything from a humanitarian assistance disaster relief to a uh, to a contingency somewhere else. Um, now the importance of partnership and uh, and partnership building partnership capacity uh, is an important part of my theater campaign plan. Uh, I look out about five years. I look at all the countries. First of all, the, the five allies, and how are we strengthening our allies? Uh, capacity to work uh, with us, uh, to, uh, to be able to, uh, to be seamless with us in our operations. Uh, and it varies among the allies about their maturity of that. Uh, and so we have to take that in consideration. But certainly uh, my hope is that they are able to continue to do more uh, and that they're able to continue to contribute more uh, across uh, all spectrums of potential uh, uh, crisis, whether it's from a humanitarian disaster uh, relief or whether it's all the way up to a higher end contingency. Um, we are looking for, um, continue to look for partnerships beyond our alliances. As you know, we're looking for a long-term uh, strategic partnership with India. So I've been to India and we begin this dialogue. Uh, India has a tremendous uh, capability to, 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 uh, to be a, a security uh, grant guarantor in their part of the world, in the Indian Ocean, and we welcome that. And we look for opportunities so that we uh, so we maintain our interoperability. And, and a lot of these things uh, require um, the types of things in our budget that sometimes might look like, well, you can do without that. But, but you know, an exercise with a potential partner that, in, that allows us to improve and help them improve their capacity becomes important. And things like uh, CRs and sequestrations uh, 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 kill those first. Yeah. Now, I think that those pieces are going to be critical going forward. We're going to need as many partners, and it's really a more effective way to operate. I know different theater, but in Africa, we had a lot of success with partnership capacity, which has helped us deal with Somalia and Yemen um, in a much less costly and, I think, more effective manner. Thank you, Admiral. Appreciate the time. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Thornberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for uh, being here today. I just want to follow up on this um, uh, question about a CR versus appropriation bill, because we're going to have an opportunity later this week to vote on a defense MILCON appropriation bill. And, and within just very limited time th that I have, I, I would appreciate each of you describing generally how big a difference it makes, whether you have the same amount of money to operate under a CR for the rest of the fiscal year or the same amount of money to operate under a regular appropriation bill. Is it a big deal to you? Is it medium? Is it, is it not that much difference at all, General Kaler? Congressman, it, it is a big deal to us. Uh, in, in particular, I think, number one, it, it helps put certainty back into the process. It, it converts uncertainty to certainty. 
the second thing is that, uh, of course, it, it uh, establishes, or at least we would hope that it establishes a different baseline. Instead of continuing to baseline uh, fiscal 12 uh, numbers, uh, it would baseline a, a different uh, number in fiscal year 13. And, of course, uh, I think that that would be very helpful uh, for us in, in my small O&M piece of the pie. Uh, it would also, uh, I'm, I would believe, anyway, it would help the service chiefs quite a bit. Okay. Admiral? Uh, yes, sir, it's a big deal. Um, I was the uh, programmer for the Navy in a previous job, and so I had a chance to see how budgets were built and POM processes worked and how all that happened. And on the surface, it sounds like, well, what do you complain about? You had all the same money you had last year, so why don't you just get on with it? Uh, but money's not spent that way. It's not executed that way. It's executed through, as you know, through what you all passed to us as a budget that has certain assumptions in it and, and changes. So when you look at a 12 budget compared to a 13 budget, there's some fundamental assumptions that the service chiefs had to make, the changes about they as they move forward to rebalance, to change the nature of their force structure, and those things can't be accomplished. And so they end up, and I think in the case of the Navy this year, they they're end up carrying an excess bills on things that they thought they were going to be able to do in 13 that you haven't allowed them to do because there hadn't been an appropriation to allow it. And so there's, there's unintended large bills they have to contend with that if they had perfect fungibility on their, on their budget, perfect discretion, then they, we'd, they'd be able to solve it or maybe solve part of it. But they don't have that, and um, I wouldn't advocate that they did. But, it's, uh, but I think it's what makes the difference. Well, I, like the chairman, I, I hope that we can do that because I'm afraid we've got a limited window to get a defense appropriation bill done or else we're going to all be living under a CR for the rest of the year, and uh, which, which uh, w would not be good. Uh, General Kaler, let me change the subject right quick and just ask you this question, which has always perplexed me. All this talk about nuclear weapons, and we've got charts our staff has provided with the treaty limits and so forth, but nothing ever takes into account the tactical weapons. Uh, as you do military planning, as you try to assess the effects of a blast from one nuclear weapon versus another, is there really a difference between a tactical nuclear weapon and a strategic nuclear weapon as far as the, the importance that you have to place on it is in, in terms of, of military consequences? Or is it more a political difference? Congressman, it's more a political difference in, in what you call it, really. It's like calling a platform strategic or tactical. It's really about effect. It's not about the platform and it's not about the weapon. Um, in most cases, uh, and certainly if you're on the receiving end, I don't think you notice much difference uh, from a nuclear weapon that somebody says is a tactical weapon or one that somebody says is a strategic weapon. I think that um, we've used that as an accounting method over the years for arms control purposes, and I understand why we've done that. We used to make a bigger distinction between strategic and tactical nuclear things, different decision processes, et cetera. But I think as a practical matter, as we go forward, uh, th there's probably less utility in describing the weapons that way. In fact, the Nuclear Posture Review uh, laid out some of that uh, with a suggestion that, that it's probably time as we go back and, and uh, chat again with, with the Russians uh, for us to address uh, what we have called historically non-strategic or tactical nuclear weapons. I think that's a prudent thing for us to do, and I think it's probably time for us to do it. Great. That, that's helpful to me. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll you back. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for all of you for being here. I think you've tried to clarify the uh, shift or the rebalancing to the Pacific uh, as best you can, but I recently ha was at a conference and there was really quite a bit of skepticism uh, about that and the fact that this was really about containing China. Could you comment on that? Yes, Congressman, I get the same question. Uh, throughout the, my uh, uh, AOR, in fact, over half the world, different countries, I get almost the same question. Um, first, the, the, the rebalance is a strategy of collaboration, uh, not one of containment. Uh, if we wanted to contain any country, we'd kind of know how to do that, and we wouldn't be doing what we're doing now. Um, now, to that degree, I can't tell you whether uh, another country feels contained by our activities. That's that's in the eyes of the beholder. 
Uh, but in the case of China, as I've communicated to them when they've asked me this as well, I said, first of all, you have to recognize that you, the U.S. is a Pacific nation. Uh, we have lots of uh, national interests in this part of the world. Uh, we're going to stay here. We're here with our allies. We're concerned about a security environment that protects our interest. We recognize that uh, China is on the rise, both economically and as a regional power. And we uh, think that we can accommodate China into, those, into the econ economic world as well as the security world, and that they have the opportunity to come in as a net provider of security, and that we're happy to allow that to happen, and we'll actually facilitate them coming in if necessary. Uh, but uh, they, uh, as all others do, have choices that have to be made. Uh, and um, we're just hopeful that those choices will be ones that bring them in a productive way. How, have any of our allies in the region expressed some concern that they might have to choose um, between being their friends in the region, if, if in fact that they, they perceive it that way? Right. Well, I think there's two concerns. Uh, one is uh, they all express that the last thing they want to see happen is for the U.S. and China to have an adversarial relationship. It's not in our best interest, not in China's best interest, and it's certainly not in theirs. And so they're all pretty emphatic about that. Uh, the second thing is, that, as you just said, is they don't want to have to choose. Uh, I don't see a, a reason for them to have to choose at this point in time, uh, assuming that we all make the choice for peace and prosperity and a security environment that can ensure that. Yeah. It, if I could just go back to a second to the, the um, discussion that we've had about building capacity. One of the things that we've tried to do, and I know you all have, have been actively involved in, in a more of a whole of government approach, and yet as we see with budget cuts and constraints that we have, that that is certainly going to affect other agencies, other government agencies that are part of this, uh, as well as other entities, private, um, and, and certainly our allies in the region. What role then do, do you play? Um, will we be, be playing to, to enable that relationship to continue given the budget constraints that probably will be falling on them tougher uh, than yours? Well, I think for some time the benefit of the Pacific Command is that they've had a, a view not just at the military side but, the, but many of the other aspects of the whole of government just because of the size of the region and how hard it is to get around. I mean, if you take a look at the, just the number of, of your members that actually make it in the Pacific, it, 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 it's because it's so long and so hard to get there, uh, it, it makes it more difficult. Uh, so what I've done in my headquarters is I have uh, expanded in there the outreach I have to other, agents, other agencies, and I have them actually in physically inside of my headquarters. So it allows me a conduit into the other agencies that uh, I use routinely to ensure that whatever assets and, and things that I do are well synergized with the other activities. So I have a very close relationship with our, with our partnerships at, at State, with AID, with Energy, uh, with the Drug Inform, DEA, uh, the FBI, the CIA. All these are present inside of my headquarters, and uh, it's a team effort, uh, not uh, just a military one. Do you see those being compromised at all in the coming year or so? Well, as I uh, speak to them, I think they're less uncertain about the impacts on them than I am. Would you recommend LME. that that they have the same flexibility, perhaps, that you all are going to be having? Uh, it would be uh, <laughs> flexibility is always good, I think, particularly if you're trying to rebalance. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. General and Admiral, we want to first thank you for your service to our country. Thank you for the weight you both carry on your shoulders, and thank you for the professionalism you both Great. display in a very unstable policy world. Yay. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for trying to bring some stability to national security and all you've done to do that. And I want to first of all set our context. You know, we're talking about with sequestration cuts that will be about $42.5 billion this year. But we need to realize that the administration has already come in here and voluntarily taken 19 times that amount of cuts already because we've cut about $800 billion out of the last four years. So if I could put those into a sequencing and for measurement purposes put them as 20 cuts, one of those cuts would come from sequestration, but 19 of them would have already been coming from the administration. 
We fought against them because we said they do not leave us any bumps in the road. They don't leave us a situation in case we have a downturn in the economy or a national crisis. Indeed, we spent more than this on relief for Hurricane Sandy. But we are where we are, and, Admiral, the question I would have for you is this. Our Navy is currently at 286 ships. When we add the cuts already made to national security with the cuts under sequestration, this figure could fall to the 230 range. Yet the demand for Navy assets only continues to increase. Admiral, in your best military judgment, is our Navy large enough today to meet the demand of both your COCOM and our international responsibilities in the coming day, decades? And what are the risks we're assuming if it's not? Well, I'd like to make my comments from that of a joint commander's perspective, not necessarily from a, a person who's in the Navy, because I think there's always a perception, well, you're a Navy guy, you're going to say the right thing. Uh, we, the, the Navy uh, and the Joint Force have consistently s said that the, that the U.S. Navy uh, should be in the range of 306 to 313, somewhere in that number. And that number, I think you could argue about the eaches of that number. Uh, today we're at about 285 ships. But I think when you back it up into the, the larger context, it's really what is it you want your Navy to do? Um, so there's always the, the comments, well, um, you know, your, your Navy's larger than the 10 largest navies in, in the world, so what are you worried about? I said, if you put that in the context of having to defend your home shores with your Navy, whether it's off of Long Beach or whether it's off of Norfolk, that's, that argument is pretty good. But if you look at the world as a global common, and you as a world leader in both economics, in social, and military, and that you want to be able to influence what happens in that global common to the benefit of the American people and to secure our uh, uh, national interest there, then you start talking about size matters and the numbers matter because, you know, only one ship can be at one time, one place at one time. And they're much more powerful ships. They are. They're, they're really great ships we have today. But when you're talking about 285 and what we've seen happen just in the last decade uh, with uh, the pressure that's in the, the, from the Middle East, the Persian Gulf, uh, to what's happened off the Horn of Africa for anti-piracy, to my, my requirement to have to, to, to deter, assure, and prevent in, a, in, a very, in, a, in what an area is, is becoming more complex, the numbers that we have in the Navy today are too small because my, re my, my requirements are not being satisfied by the Navy today. So in that context, it, it, it's probably 285 is not, uh, not meeting the global demand for the world we find ourselves in today. Admiral, can you give us a picture of, let's just take, you know, our, our most important capabilities in Asia Pacific is probably going to be our attack submarines. Can you give us a picture kind of where we're going to line up number-wise in the next decade between the number of submarines the Chinese will have versus ours in the Pacific area? If we stay on the course we are today. Yes. Well, I won't give you exact numbers. I'll just give you rel relative. I mean, I think there's well over 300 uh, very quiet or extremely quiet diesel submarines globally today. Some are by or have owned by our friends and allies, others by, by, by not. And then there's another subset of another set of those that are nuclear capable ships that have much longer ranges and that type of thing. Um, the, the growth of the Chinese submarine force uh, is uh, a little bit puzzling to me uh, in both its size and its sophistication. Uh, I believe the predictions are it's going to grow to about 70, high 70s or 80, eight, the numbers of 80. Uh, that, um, you know, it's the Chinese decision on how, how big they want their, their submarine community to grow. And I, don't, and I think it's, as they get uh, more uh, global that they're going to have to build a military that can be more global and protect their interests as well. But that number of submarines in a very uh, basically constricted space, it causes a little bit of questions. Now, uh, to compare their submarines or, uh, to ours is a little bit of uh, apples and oranges comparison, but the numbers in, in the Pacific will be uh, of submarines that we have day-to-day -to, -day to operate will be less than that. How many? I, I, I'd just rather answer that offline to give you the exact number. Thank you. Sorry. Congressman, may, may I just pitch into this? Please. A as a joint commander, we ask our Navy to do something else that's critically important. Fourteen of those ships are Trident ballistic missile submarines that form the most survivable part of our uh, strategic deterrent. 
And when we talk about deterrence and assurance, uh, a, a great deal of what we um, must be mindful of is the extended deterrence that provides the assurance uh, for our allies and our partners uh, around the world. I think as we go forward, uh, we need to be very mindful that those Trident submarines are going to reach the end of their service life at some point in time. And part of the recapitalization that we are going to need to proceed with, even in tough financial times, will be the recapitalization of that ballistic missile submarine force. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your patience. Thank you. Mr. Larson. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to discuss uh, uh, briefly some of this, the flexibility issue. This issue came up last week when we had a hearing with the Federal Aviation Administration. And uh, now the majority of the House, the majority of the Senate voted for the situation we're in today, um, sequestration. We're trying to find a way out of it uh, now. But uh, to underline the um, inflexibility of sequestration, the question came up at, FAA, at the FAA hearing um, based on the concept that a lot of people just think there's a line item for waste, fraud, and abuse in every agency, including in, in STRATCOM and including in PACOM, including in every agency in the federal government. And FAA has to cut about $627 million um, out. Uh, but under sequestration, even if, the, even if there's a line item of waste, fraud, and abuse, and it was $627 million, they could still only cut 8 to 10 percent of that because of the strict rules of sequestration. And that just underscores the um, inflexibility of the inflexibility of sequestration and underscores the importance, at least for step one, of providing some flexibility. But I would also argue that that flexibility should apply to all agencies and not just to the Department of Defense. Um, I've got folks who are uh, making choices about housing vouchers for in nonprofit housing authorities in my district. I have folks who are making decisions about not delivering meals to seniors who are um, shut-ins in their homes through the Meals on Wheels program. Uh, at least having some flexibility in other agencies, I mean, if it's good enough for the goose, it's good enough for the gander, um, in my view. But I, I want to move, though, to another set of issues with regards to that. And uh, uh, General Kaler, you mentioned it more so in your oral testimony, and Admiral Lockler, you mentioned more of it in your written testimony, and that is the uh, impact of the pay freeze that impacts your civilian employees, as well as the furloughs. Can both of you, very briefly, a minute each, with General Kaler first and Admiral Lockler second, can you discuss in a little more detail the impact of the potential furlough and, pay, and the current pay freeze, as well as the proposed pay freeze, it's having on your civilian employees and the ability to do their job? Sir, I, I would add to that a hiring freeze as well, which we've had for quite some time, and also a reduction. Uh, while we went through a contractor to civilian conversion, then we went through some civilian reductions over the last several years. And so it's, it's a combination of all of those things that have been impacting our civilians. In terms of the furlough, those, the pay freeze and the furlough, I think, as I said in my opening remarks, both of those are, are causing our civilians to question their future. And, and I think there's an intangible impact there. It will, it will have a practical effect on some of our people. Um, it, it will have an intangible effect on all of them. And, and how to characterize that, we've been struggling with that a little bit, uh, certainly in my headquarters. Uh, we believe that in my headquarters we can stagger the way the civilian uh, furlough is applied to try to minimize mission impact. But I can tell you there are some places out beyond STRATCOM headquarters where people sustain critical parts of our nuclear deterrent, for example, where it may not be possible to stagger the workforce furlough. Um, and for example, um, I, I know that the Navy was looking at uh, how they will manage uh, civilian furloughs in the strategic warfare centers on the Atlantic and the Pacific that support the Trident ballistic missile submarines. Uh, they tell me that when you get right down to it, there's a critical pathway for sustaining those. You got 10 more seconds. It's a critical pathway, and they may not be able to to stagger furloughs. You may have to take block furloughs. Those are the kind of issues we're going to work our way through. Thank you. Admiral Lockler. Well, first, I think uh, 
what we what we are potentially going to do to our civilians in this is um, is somewhat tragic. Um, I think over time the uh, in an all volunteer force, the line between our civil servants who ser serve in our defense department and our all and our military have blurred uh, to some degree, and we rely very very heavily on these civil servants to do the type of things that you might historically have considered as kind of core military. But let me just give you a couple of examples. In the state of Hawaii alone, there's uh, where my home is, uh, there's about um, uh, 20,000 civilian employees. So on 21 April, I understand when this takes effect, they will effectively take a 20% reduction in pay for the rest of this year. Now, I don't know about everybody in this room, but I don't think I could take a 20% cut in pay in a high cost area where I have children in school and I have uh, mortgages in a high cost uh, living area and I don't know how I'd survive it. Uh, and yet we're going to ask them to do it, and, uh, and chances are many of them will. Many of them may not. Um, in the area of things, it'll have trickle-down effects. For instance, in our DoDEA schools, of where, which educate all my children that are our children that are overseas, most of them are civilians, uh, government civilians. So that means that uh, one-fifth of the teachers won't be teaching on any given day in those schools which are already uh, probably pressurized uh, to be as efficient as possible. Our hospital systems overseas are mostly uh, government employees. So we're going to have a decrease in the hospital care immediately. So those are, I could go, I could just keep going on, but that's uh, the tip of the iceberg. Thank you. For the time. Thank, you, Thank you very much. And I would just note that that same principle applies to a lot of other agencies outside the mm -hmm. Department of Defense and services provided to people around this country. Thank you. There, there is no question that this is going to spread pain uh, across the whole uh, federal government of employees. And I wish I had the ability to uh, bring an appropriation bill for everything, but I don't think we should let the perfect be the uh, enemy of the good, the better. And we do have the opportunity to vote on an appropriation bill, who, which has gone through the process Unfortunate that the uh, we never got a budget out of the Senate, and we've had to operate under these kind of conditions. But but we should really again be very mindful of this vote this week, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, am I the good, the better, or the perfect, or just the enemy? You're the perfect. You now have four minutes and fifty <laughs> seconds left. <laughs> It's always a penalty attached. General Kaler, if, if I could ask you what I think are about six pretty basic questions, if I could, please. Um, in your opinion, do you, would you say that, or believe that uh, further nuclear reduction should be bilateral and verifiable rather than unilateral? Is there a significant advantage in that? Sir, if, if we're going to go beyond uh, the new start levels of 1,550, then I think that should be bilateral. Are you aware of any precedent that this nation has ever undertaken to negotiate a bilateral and verifiable agreement that did not take the form of a treaty? Uh, and if you need time to look that up and you sir, feel more comfortable, I can do well, that. Well, I'd like to take that for the record. I, and, and why I'm hesitating, I'm not sure um, – the agreement that was made uh, between the United States and Russia with President Bush to go to uh, 18 to 2200 weapons, I just don't recall. I, I, I'll have to take that for the record, sir. Okay. Um, it, I mean, why do we need to have things that are verifiable? Is, I mean, is verifiable there simply because we need to know if there's cheating involved? It's uh, certainly there's an element of verification that gets to whether parties are cheating. Uh, I, I think that's a piece of it. Another piece, I think, is there's a transparency uh, piece of verification. Uh, there's certainly um, an, an information exchange piece of verification. There are insights that, that are, uh, are all gained from verification. But I think at its core, uh, verification is, is about um, – ensuring that, that we can uh, place our trust uh, in, in a country that we've entered an agreement with. Is, is, there, kind of, is there some kind of threshold? So is, is cheating more military significant at a lower force level? 
I think the I get the question, sir, sometimes about uh, cheating. I think there are two answers from my perspective about cheating. Number one, I think any any country that intentionally cheats, I think that there's a significant uh, concern uh, about that. But then the second question is, does the cheating have a military effect? Uh, I think that's a different question, and the answer is it depends. So, so if if a country were to break a key obligation under an arms control commitment, you know, like. Uh, say, one of the central limits of the New START Treaty, is that militarily significant? It, it can be, yes, sir. Is there a threshold level about that? I mean, would 10 missiles be significant, 50? How many would be required to make it significant? Well, I, I, think, I think we would have to take a hard look at the circumstances. Uh, I, I, so what I would say is, I mean, you could, you could take this to an extreme. You could say if, if 1,550 accountable warheads is what the treaty says and someone has 1,551, is that militarily significant? And, and I, 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 we could assess that. What, what if the concept was either developing or deploying a prohibited type of weapon? I, th I think that's significant? That can, ha that can have military significance. It's hard to talk about this in the abstract, though. Yeah, I, I understand that. Thank you. If, if you reduce your nuclear force by a third, um, is there any way that that is not militarily significant? Sir, we, we begin the conversations about how many weapons we need based on strategy and, and national objectives. And so, and then we take a hard look at the threat and the potential threat. Ultimately, as we work our way through this, this turns into military tasks in the face of a threat, and how many weapons we need is based on that. And so if without some changing circumstances that go with this, without some changing um, uh, conversation about the threat, it's hard, again, to look at does one-third make a difference, does ten weapons make a difference, et cetera. So the key element then in that decision is the threat itself. Uh, if there is no reduction in our outside threat, that would still be a significant impact. I think there are two, two primary drivers of this. One is the potential threat or the nature of the potential threat. The other is the national guidance and the strategy that we are trying and the objectives we are trying to achieve. Those are both together. I think in the long run, though, my view is that if we are going to engage in another conversation about reductions below New START, that should be done in a bilateral sense. That should be done with the Russians. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back an additional two seconds, including the ones I took earlier. Thank you. Mr. Courtney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Um, Admiral, um, on page nine of your testimony, you uh, clearly I think wanted to convey a, a point of highlighting the uh, advances in undersea warfare in the Asia Pacific area, which again, uh, Mr. Forbes' question sort of alluded to. Um, you know, one question I hear all the time uh, from other members um, is, you know, why do we need submarines? And, uh, you know, aren't they Cold War relics? Uh, again, your um, testimony, again, suggests that actually there's, this, there's something changing out there. And I just was wondering if you could sort of, you know, maybe elaborate a little bit more uh, than your prior answers in terms of just how submarines fit into a, a modern security strategy. Well, I would disagree with anyone that said that they're Cold War relics. Um, the, the modern submarine force of today first is globally deployable. Um, it's a highly proficient force. And it does things well beyond what uh, th people would think from a Cold War perspective. <laughs> They are significant in intelligence and reconnaissance collection. Uh, they have long-range strike capability when necessary. They have the ability to carry special forces and special operating forces into denied areas. Uh, they have the ability to, to, uh, to use the asymmetric advantage of stealth under the ocean and able to be a force multiplier for a force or a nation that has global interest, uh, particularly as you talk about maritime domain and uh, ensuring that we have proper access. You know, this is always r widely reported that 95 percent of everything that moves on the global economy moves on the ocean. That's true. What's not reported is in the last decade or so, that number has quadrupled. Uh, and so whether it's energy or whether it's uh, uh, the things that need to be supplied to local stores in our country, uh, it's, it, it is the, the, the global economy runs on the oceans. 
And so to cede that uh, to, to anyone at any time is not in our best interest. Submarines have a significant play in making sure that uh, we have freedom of access to our national interest. Great. Thank you. That was a very good um, statement that I think is helpful uh, as we, again, have to always deal with competing priorities here. Um, you know, on page 28 of your testimony, you talked about, again, the um, need for bilateral and multilateral communication collaboration, as you said, is really what the pivot to, to Asia Pacific is really about. Um, at the end of January, there was an incident in East China Sea where uh, it was reported that Chinese uh, frigate uh, locked, uh, actually, um, weapons on uh, Japanese uh, vessels. And um, there's obviously now this sort of competing dispute about whether it really happened or whether it did happen. And I mean, you know, to me, that's sort of where, you know, the, the um, success of whether or not collaboration is going to work in terms of whether or not we've got systems here for making sure everybody's communicating well and understands what's going on out there. Um, and, you know, the last thing in the world is that we want an incident like this to, to escalate into something where we're going to be sort of involved. And I just wonder if you could sort of comment, not necessarily about what actually happened there, but, you know, how do we get ahead of these kinds of, because there's a lot of congestion out there is what we're hearing this morning, to make sure that we don't sort of run into these um, incidents that spin out of control. Well, because I wasn't actually at the scene when it occurred, right. um, but it was reported by the Japanese forces, and I think subsequently denied by the by the Chinese. Uh, first, that type of activity is highly escalatory. Uh, by mature navies, it's recognized as something that you you don't do uh, unless you're directed to do it, uh, and it's because it's a a move towards greater hostilities. I believe that uh, at, if it uh, had occurred that the Japanese would have been able to detect it. Their, their Navy and their military is sophisticated enough to be able to, to understand what was being done. Um, and I have uh, uh, been uh, complimentary of the Japanese command and control and their ability to maintain uh, a level of uh, calm and as they work through this very difficult, challenging security uh, issue they're dealing with. And I think that is is indicative of the close uh, alliance relationship we've had in building our our navies and our militaries together in that alliance to understand each other. And so I, I, I think that kind of worked. And we have very close, I have very close communication with the Japanese uh, leadership on, on the military side of, the, of these issues, and I'm quite comfortable with that. Uh, now, on the Chinese side, we're trying to create these avenues. Um, we've uh, been successful in the last couple of years, I think, historically successful in being able to keep our mill-to-mill -mill relationships going, even through periods of time when we disagree as a nation. I mean, there'll be, you don't have to, to a, power, a, a superpower and a rising power that won't have competition and won't have friction. Uh, the question is, how do you manage that friction so that, it, that it's productive rather than, than negative? So we're opening venues. We have a, a tremendous number of... Uh, high-level engagements. I've been to Beijing twice just in the last year to, to talk to my counterparts. I've had them come to Hawaii. So we're improving in our dialogue. Uh, we need, there's more to do, much more to do, and much more to do, I think, at the tactical level of uh, being able to have that uh, near-term voice-to-voice uh, -voice communication, mill-to-mill -mill with the Chinese that we, quite frankly, don't have yet, but that we're working towards. Thank you, Admiral. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Kaler, in your discussions with Representative Bishop, you were talking about threats and strategy and basically that the process you were describing it was in part uh, determining what our requirements are for our nuclear deterrent. Um, you are the requirements setter for our nuclear deterrent, and you look at um, you know, yourself as a, a customer of our National Nuclear Security Administration. As you know, I'm very concerned about our plutonium capability uh, and have been an advocate for uh, the uh, completion of the CMRR that was um, part of the administration's promises in, in the New START uh, process. We've heard of the proposal, as CMRR has been delayed, of an interim strategy of perhaps a, a modular approach, <clears throat> and um, we're very concerned about you know, lack of details uh, with what those uh, interim strategies might be for satisfying our need for plutonium capability and what the uh, modular approach uh, might be. 
Uh, so I, I, I'm assuming that you have the details <clears throat> of those proposals, and I have a series of, of questions about them. You know, one, do you have the details? And, and two, if you had to pick between what you're hearing about the modular approach and the interim strategy uh, versus CMRR, w w which would you pick? Uh, uh, if you were only going to get one. Well, let me start with we, we have spent the last year, I think as you know, as when we came in front of your committee last year, uh, I expressed some grave concerns about the plan uh, that we had uh, for the nuclear enterprise, the weapons complex and the weapons life extensions and other activities themselves. Uh, because as I said at the time, it, the plan didn't close, as you well know. Uh, we took the last year and we sat down uh, as the Nuclear Weapons Council and we worked our way with the National Nuclear Security Administration through uh, a strategic approach, through an implementation plan. We uh, associated budget with that and all of that is pending uh, with the uh, FY14 budget release, uh, which I can't describe today. What, what I don't know is what's going to happen to it now because uh, I am far more comfortable with, with the approach that I believe that we've hammered out over the last year. I believe that the plan does close. It's not without risk, but I don't know what's going to happen to it, given the fiscal uncertainty and fiscal year 14 in particular. An element of that plan uh, deals with the plutonium uh, needs that we're going to have. And uh, again, if you're asking me if I pick between one thing or the other, I think the practical matter is that one way or another, we are going to need to have an interim strategy for plutonium. Whatever we decide to do in the long term, we are going to need to do something on an interim basis. So, so you are you saying you have uh, sufficient enough details on the interim strategy, which perhaps includes the modular approach, to endorse that strategy with the Nuclear Weapons Council? Well, I think, again, I need to be a little careful here because the entire plan hasn't been released. But, but I have been comfortable with the proposal that, that we've discussed regarding an interim plutonium strategy. And that's different than what do you do in the longer term. Well, that's my next question, actually. So let me, let me frame that, which will be part of what your answer is. You know, there's, there's the issue of, you know, which would you want, CMRR or the interim strategy? The, the picking, and that's a long-term term strategy. But the second aspect of that, so there's two components. One, you know, do, do you think we could maintain an interim strategy uh, in, in, in perpetuity versus the investment required for CMRR? But the, the second aspect is, would, would you ever consider undertaking reductions in our hedge based upon just the interim strategy versus the long-term strategy of the CMRR? Well, let me go back to the, the interim strategy. I, I, again, I don't think we have a choice. I think that we have to do some kind of an interim strategy. The question then becomes, okay, what do we do next? And I think that that, that isn't quite uh, solid in my mind yet, and I think that's going to be one of the open questions uh, as we come forward. Again, assuming – I don't know what to assume about the 14 budget at this point in time, to tell you the absolute truth. But But having said that, uh, I believe you have to do some kind of an interim strategy. I believe that that gets us through uh, the time period that we're talking about. Certainly in the long run, we would prefer to see a more permanent solution to the plutonium needs, and I think that will also, I think there are a number of steps that impact a hedge strategy. That's one of them. Great, because you would agree that the, our ability to have a long-term ability for production in a production infrastructure should be a basis for us considering whether or not we reduce any of our hedge uh, in case there isn't an issue with, uh, with, with the weapons that we have. Uh, sir, I think that's one consideration. I don't think that's the only consideration. And I think that, that there are some scenarios you, that you can unfold where an interim strategy will, will serve us uh, even uh, under some uh, technical issues. So I, but I think for the United States of America in the long term that, that we want a, a permanent solution to the nuclear enterprise that includes a permanent solution to the plutonium. I appreciate that. I'm surprised, General, by your last answer. Thank you. Ms. Hanabusa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, General, and of course, aloha, Admiral. Admiral, in reviewing your testimony, um, and this is, a, this is a hearing on the posture of both of your commands, I did not see a, a real specific reference to PMRF. And I wanted to give both of you the opportunity to, to testify about the importance of PMRF in both of your postures. Admiral? 
Aloha. Aloha. Well, I, I mean, I think that <clears throat> for those of you who visit Hawaii and and go to Kauai to see PRMF, I think it becomes uh, readily apparent the importance of it, particularly as we uh, pursue our technologies and our research and development and are able to demonstrate in an airspace uh, our ability to do ballistic missile defense, to develop those technologies which are critical to our own homeland defense. Uh, one of the problems we have is, in, is, is finding ranges in places where you can actually have the airspace and the in the outer space, if you call it, to be able to 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 fly targets and to be able to do them, and PRM, PRMF uh, is a um, uh, relatively uh, modest uh, organization, but they carry a lot of weight in this. And uh, I think uh, you would see that any future strategy we have towards our ballistic missile defense will have a that PRMF will play a central role in being able to test and evaluate those systems. Thank you. General, did, would you like to add to that? Congresswoman, I would just say uh, that I completely agree, and I would add one other point, although it isn't uh, completely related uh, to, uh, to Hawaii, uh, the importance of the facilities on Kwajalein farther to the south and west are, are equally important for those same reasons. Uh, that's uh, where we, uh, the, the entire Pacific Range complex that includes PMRF, it includes Kwajalein, it includes Vandenberg at the eastern end of it, it includes other assets. Uh, is critically important for us for missile defense purposes, for our ability to uh, continue to demonstrate the effectiveness of the nuclear deterrent, and for uh, lots of other reasons, development of radar and other things. So all of those are important places. Thank you. And for those who may not understand PMRF, it is the Pacific Missile Range Facility. Uh, Admiral, I think the, uh, the chair of the uh, uh, subcommittee on CPAR sort of got into it, and that is how many ships do you need? We had a hearing uh, earlier last week, I believe, where uh, SECNAV, former SECNAV uh, layman testified, as well as uh, Admiral Ruffhead also testified, and we had a range of numbers. Of course, we all know that uh, Admiral Lehman, I mean, the Secretary Layman is known for his 600 fleet uh, under President Reagan, uh, but he says 346 is his number, and Admiral Ruffhead said 325 to 345. So when I asked them, well, what does that mean, they both kind of said it depends on our needs and that we are to understand that when we're talking about a fleet, that there are support vessels and everything else associated with it. If you were to pick a number that you believe would be uh, necessary, what would that number be? And also, what would the number be for you to accomplish what you feel is necessary for what I call your depth? Uh, in the Pacific? Well, you can see you get uh, competing numbers from almost any source you talk to. I, I, I would start by saying that the number we have today is insufficient. So for, from that, start from that perspective. But if, if, you, if, you, if you look at, <clears throat> uh, I think, at navies and, it's, and other aspects of our force, it really starts by how do you define your, your what, what it is you want to do? What is your national aspirations around the globe? And from a maritime perspective, the globe is actually getting, not physically bigger, but it's actually getting more challenges. When I was a young junior officer, I never contemplated operating in the Horn of Africa. I probably didn't know where it was because we just didn't go there. Uh, I would not contemplate uh, uh, you know, wouldn't have contemplated that there was a potential for Arctic operations in my lifetime. But, you know, that's going to probably happen in the next generation of naval officers that have to go and deal with this. Um, I wouldn't have uh, anticipated the rise of some of the militaries that we're seeing and that in the lack of transparency in some of them and, and what that would mean. So, uh, you know, the debate about how big the Navy is has been one that's historic in our, our nation, but it's really about how do we define our, ourselves. And if we think we're going to be a global maritime power and a maritime domain that's increasingly important, then we have to build a Navy that can stay out there and we can sustain it. Um, the one we have today, I think, um, is challenged to do that. Uh, and uh, the exact numbers, like I said, it depends on, on what you want to do and where you want to do it at and what type of ships you want to do it with. But as you can see, just in my lifetime, we've grown from a, basically a sea control environment to now a ballistic missile defense environment. So. Many of the requirements that are driven in the PACOM AOR about 
about my surface ships are equally as much about anti-submarine warfare and maritime security and control of the seas uh, is equally about ballistic missile defense of our homeland and defense of our uh, of our uh, allies and the treaty allies we have. So um, we really think I think we really need to do have that debate about what is the right size for that. And I think uh, the CNO is heading that direction. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Rogers. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Cater, good to see you again. Uh, I want to ask you uh, if you agree with uh, a statement made by Secretary Panetta last year before this committee in testimony. Quote, reductions that have been made, at least in this administration, have only been made as a part of the start process and not outside of that process. And I would expect that that would be the same in the future. Close quote. Is that the right the way to, to do our reductions? Congressman, yes, I think so. Thank you. Uh, next. Um, Assistant Secretary of State Stephen Rademacher stated in 2006 that, quote, President Yeltsin committed to similar reductions in Russian tactical nuclear weapons, but consider considerable concern exists that the Russian commitments have not been entirely fulfilled, close quote. <clears throat> Mr. Rademacher was discussing the President's nuclear initiatives, PNIs, which President uh, George H.W. Bush and President Yeltsin entered into, but without the treaty process, and thus it had no legal effect. In 2009, the Perry Schlesinger Commission stated in, in its final report uh, to Congress that Russia, quote, is no longer in compliance with PNI commitments. Uh, do you have any reason to believe that the Perry Schlesinger Commission was wrong? I don't, although I can tell you from our perspective today in terms of New START, uh, we believe that they are complying. They're, they are above the ultimate numbers. So are we. We're working our way down, but we believe that they're complying. What about Secretary uh, Rademacher's position that I just outlined? You know, sir, I'm going to have to take that for the record. I, I'm, I really, I, I'd like to know more about what he was really talking about. Would you uh, respond in writing? Yes, so sir. you have a chance to do that. And lastly, what would you say are our most significant concerns with respect to modernization of our aging strategic deterrent enterprise? I think that uh, I have two primary concerns. Actually, I've got three primary concerns. One is in the command and control. Uh, area to make sure that we have kept our nuclear command and control, which is more and more and more becoming national command and control capability, uh, that we keep that uh, such that that is the bedrock of, of uh, our deterrent. I think that uh, in the uh, forces themselves, uh, as I said earlier, I am, I am committed to uh, wanting to support the replacement for the Ohio ballistic missile submarines. I fully support uh, a long-range bomber uh, that will eventually come along uh, to supplement the B-2 and, and potentially uh, take the place of the B-52 as time passes. Uh, I support, even though it's not within my uh, joint command, uh, I get the use of the Air Force's aerial refueling tankers, and so I'm deeply committed uh, because I see the value of, of those tankers every single day, and I know every combatant command would say the same thing, that they see the value of those tankers every day. Uh, and I certainly uh, support the analysis of alternatives to look about uh, at, at what we might do with the Minuteman intercontinental ballistic missile beyond uh, 2030, which is where the Air Force believes they can take it today. So uh, that, that's part number two. Part number three is the weapons themselves and the nuclear enterprise that supports and sustains those weapons. We're in a different era today. Uh, the era that we are in is an era of, uh, of a moratorium on testing nuclear devices. And so uh, we've got to maintain the science that underpins those weapons. We've got to make sure we are sustaining those weapons and surveilling those weapons as they age. And then we've got life extension programs that we need to put in place. All of this comes at, at a time of significant <clears throat> fiscal challenge, as, as you all know. And uh, we're going to have to make some tough choices, I'm sure. In your opinion, is that a limitation a prohibition on uh, testing uh, inhibiting your ability to uh to modernize? No, sir, not today. It is not. Thank you, sir. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Uh, Admiral, at the end of your written remarks targets your uh, concerns regarding the impacts of inadequate maintenance. Um, and a potential bow wave of maintenance down the road. 
I know this is uh, consistent with the letter that was sent out by the Secretary of the Navy, um, which detailed cutbacks resulting from sequestration. Uh, uh, I was out on Friday at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, which is in my district in Washington State, and uh, obviously the DOD civilians who were there were concerned about furloughs and the impacts to them personally, financially. But the broader concern that was raised, and I was very impressed with, the number of people who were concerned about the implications uh, to national security, to the real physical work done uh, there at the shipyard at, at, at the West Coast hub of maintenance activity. Can you say uh, a bit more about the immediate impacts of sequestration uh, with regard to maintenance and the, mi and the mission in the Pacific uh, and, and the downstream impacts as well? And also, if you could discuss for me the impacts of delayed maintenance on carriers and the nat national security implications as we shift our strategic focus to the Pacific. Well, certainly from my <clears throat> years of experience on ships, <clears throat> you know, you, you, uh, you have to applaud our Navy today for how uh, ready it is and how it's able to sustain itself, uh, even the size it is, globally in a, in a pretty uh, intense environment. But to do that, uh, it's so far away from home, it requires <clears throat> a, a, a consistent approach to how you maintain and keep these ships going. Uh, as, you, as you know, they're not... They are complex platforms with tremendous amounts of capability that require sophisticated maintenance and upkeep. And that we do in the most cost-effective way we can, uh, using the great resources we have, like in the shipyard that, that's in your district. Uh, and over time, <clears throat> we try to build a business model that allows us to keep our forces forward with the ones we have in the most efficient way we can. So when you put a verbal in that, it's, you know, uh, you cannot change the oil in your car once. You can not change it twice, but when it, then when it's at 100,000 miles, you have an engine replacement. Uh, we need to have these ships around for 30, 35 years. Uh, this same for our airframes across the Air Force, same for our submarines. So built into them in the ex life expectancy that they have of many, many years uh, is a requirement to do ma maintenance. <clears throat> this uh, is particularly important uh, as well in our carrier force. Our carrier force, I think, uh, continues to be one of the most um, uh, important um, aspects of a peaceful maritime environment uh, around the globe. Uh, and keeping the, the size of the carrier force that we have today globally deployed uh, as a very sophisticated platform requires continuous maintenance. Of course, it's amplified by the fact that they are nuclear vessels, so there must, there's an aspect of us ensuring that, that the maintenance is done safely and properly, and I believe that the if you look across the nuclear power program that the Navy has, it's, a, it's an unbelievable model of success and safety. And we do that uh, running the entire program with basically 19 to 25 year olds. Uh, and to do that, it requires investment in ensuring that the systems are maintained properly at the right time periodicity. So as we interject this, this uh, um, in unpredictability into our maintenance schedules, and we start doing things near term, it just, it just you, you don't you just pay me now or pay me later, uh, and uh, that's the era I think we're entering into more under sequestration. Congressman, could I add a piece to that uh, from another joint perspective? I think it's important to note that uh, as we defer maintenance, we are beginning at a different starting point. We are coming out of 10 years worth of high uh, operations tempo events. And so the stress on the platforms to begin with is higher than it has been at other places when we've tried to reset in the past or at, at the end of other conflicts. This is a force that whether it's uh, flying hours on aircraft or steaming uh, hours on ships or uh, uh, vehicles uh, that the Army has, uh, we are starting at a far different place. And so the magnitude of deferred maintenance, I think, is going to be higher. We also have some older platforms today. The, the, car oil change analogy is, uh, you know, if your car already has 200,000 miles on it, you've got a different place to start. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you. I, I always try to take a moment just to express my gratitude for people like yourselves that give your whole lives to the cause of human freedom. On behalf of my little four-year-old twins, I, I'm grateful because I think they have a better chance at life because of what people like you do. Um, with that, my first question is directed to you, General Keeler. Um, I just 
I want to thank you for your written testimony in which you state, and I'll quote you if I can, uh, quote, ballistic missile threats are likely to grow at least as rapidly as our defensive, defensive assets, giving us little margin for error in acquisition and force management decisions. Sustained missile defense investments support deterrence and assurance goals by significantly improving the protection of our homeland, our forward base for forces, and our allies and partners. And I am in violent agreement with you. Uh, I think that that's well stated. And I have uh, wanted to, to ask you uh, about your concern with the potential threat posed to our critical infrastructure by a major EMP event, maybe you know GMD or <clears throat> something deliberate, or even in isolated cases, the IEMI uh, technology that seems to be at least on the North Korean uh, radar. And as stated in Stratcom's mission, you know your your responsibility to prepare prepare for uncertainty and partner with other COCOMs. How is Stratcom preparing? How does it perceive the uncertainty of a threat like uh, like EMP? Congressman, I think the entire electromagnetic spectrum needs to get more attention, and we have stood up. Uh, we, we were given over the, the past several years a number of organizations that work various parts, either assessing potential threats, whether it's EMP or, in some cases, cyber threats to our systems uh, and our capabilities. Uh, we, we have now some organizations that, that do that. We have some other organizations that uh, are looking hard at how to detect uh, such uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum issues, whether it's EMI or EMP, when it occurs. Uh, we have some others that are doing some planning against how to deal with those uh, threats as they emerge. And we've put all those together now in one uh, single uh, uh, organization. Uh, it's in many different places, but one single organization to try to address these uh, on behalf of STRATCOM and the other combatant commanders. I think we haven't paid nearly enough attention to this. I am concerned about the threat of ele electromagnetic pulse. Uh, there are some pretty good books that have been written here recently uh, about this, uh, a couple of novels that were written that, that uh, you turn the page looking for uh, the happy ending and it never comes uh, in the book. Uh, and so uh, I would tell you that uh, we are still mindful of electromagnetic pulse. It is not a Cold War relic. Uh, it is something that we need to prepare some of our systems to deal with in the operational environment. I think as we look at particularly in anti-access area denial environments in the future, one of the ways that, uh, that uh, adversaries will try to take away our U.S. advantages will be through the electromagnetic spectrum, whether that's jamming, whether that's uh, some kind of electromagnetic interference, uh, or whether it's through cyberspace, or whether it's via electromagnetic pulse. We need to be prepared for that. And uh, I think that, that we need to, uh, we, we've, we have a lot of work to do. I am not yet comfortable that we have uh, gone anywhere near uh, where the magnitude of this problem should take us. Well, thank you, sir. I'm glad you're where you are. Uh, Admiral Locklear, um, can you describe the capability for this committee? Uh, some of us are perhaps more familiar with it than others, of the sea-based uh, X-band radar and why it's important uh, as a capability, and uh, is it a capability that we need, continue to need to, to defend the United States and deployed forces, and what is its special significance uh, on issues like perhaps uh, uh, protecting us from, you know, road mobile uh, missile threats from a North Korea sometime in the future? Well, the sea-based radar has been a, uh, uh, an important part of our ballistic missile defense architecture as we've built it over the last decade or so. It's played a tremendous role in research and development. Uh, it's a great radar. It's on a mobile platform, so it has that, those attributes to it. Um, but it's not a, uh, uh, an end-all, a beat-all. I mean, it's just a part of an architecture. So as we go forward in the future, and it's, an ex and it's an expensive part of the architecture to maintain it at sea. So we, as we go forward in the future, we'll have to, to look at how it might, and we do, we're looking at that now, how it might more effectively fit into that architecture uh, over the long run or whether it's re eventually at some point in time replaced by something else. Because the nature of the platform it's on, it just becomes more and more expensive every year to keep it because it's kind of an unusual, unusual thing. Um, but it has tremendous capability, and we have 
and will continue to use it uh, as necessary to ensure that uh, we're properly defending our, our national interest. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you, thank you Mr. Mr. Johns. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm just reading some reports about uh, North Korea um, and the fact that the UN is considering a new raft of sanctions against North Korea as a result of its uh, testing of a nuclear device uh, back in um, February. Uh, the blast from that device being about double the force of the last device that was tested back in 2009 and this device being miniaturized as as was described by the North Koreans so uh, the uh, thinking is that uh, perhaps this miniaturized uh, nuclear device that was successfully tested coming behind the uh, recent uh, successful launch into space of a uh, North Korean satellite, uh, it raises the specter that there is a now a nuclear device that can fit onto a uh, missile uh, which can uh, then uh, be used to launch a nuclear strike. Um, and now, with this uh, talk of new sanctions, and there being an agreement, by the way, with the Chinese, uh, the only ally of North Korea, um, being a party to this uh, agreement for sanctions, um, uh, we're looking at an unsafe uh, area uh, of the world, no doubt, a young leader who has never been told no, uh, who's always gotten his way and who is uh, just un, uh, uneducated about uh, military affairs, world affairs, how his country fits into the overall scheme of things. And it's, uh, it's uh, sobering to think that these kinds of things are happening throughout the world but just using this as an example, and, uh, and here we are going through uh, senseless cuts to our uh, ability to defend the nation and its interest, uh, this sequestration. Uh, something has to happen. Uh, but tell me, what, uh, what do you think, uh, how, did, what, how do things look as far as North Korea, uh, which threatens to uh, um, withdraw from its uh, armistice agreement uh, to uh, f that has resulted in uh, no hostilities over there. Well, I won't say no hostilities, but has t kept hostilities low. What um, what do you see happening over in North Korea? And I'll ask that first of uh, General Keller, and then uh, if you would respond, uh, Admiral. Congressman, from my perspective in Strategic Command, uh, all of the items that you described are deeply concerning. Uh, we have uh, seen North Korea parade uh, a long-range uh, ICBM. There are, I think, valid questions about how far along that program is. Uh, we've seen other steps that you mentioned. Uh, and so all of that together is deeply, deeply troubling. Uh, we have been involved with a review of our our plans and our posture uh, related to North Korea, particularly uh, we've been working very hard with, with Pacific Command and Northern Command regarding our ballistic missile defense posture and our ballistic missile defense approach. So as I said earlier, with, with, uh, I am confident that STRATCOM can perform its deterrence and assurance mission today uh, and, that, and that we are capable of extending our deterrent umbrella over our key allies in Admiral Locklear's area of responsibility. Uh, I am equally confident that, that we can meet uh, the, a limited uh, missile threat uh, from North Korea with the ballistic missile defenses that we have in place. All Having right. Well, give, given that, could I now, since I only have 20 seconds, yes, sir. could I go to Admiral? 
Well, uh, to to your comments, uh, I think you articulated what uh, Kim Jong Un wants the world to believe, um, and so the fact that he talks about it and demonstrates things and shows things, I think it causes us to have to to take them at least be concerned about them. But I think the important thing for the new leader to recognize is that uh, in the end, uh, this will be unsuccessful. Uh, in the end, this is not in the best interest of the people of North Korea, where the average citizen gets about 800 calories a day. They spent more money on the missile launch in one day than they could they could have fed their entire nation for one day or for one month on what they spent in one day to launch a missile. And so um, uh, we're uh, us and our our Korean allies uh, we're postured uh, to ensure we're monitoring carefully what's going on on the on the Korea Peninsula. Uh, obviously, our defensive forces are postured in case uh, um, in case uh, something really crazy were to, to happen. Uh, but in the end, uh, we have to, I think, uh, number one, applaud the efforts of the UN Security Council as they continue to put pressure on this regime from all sides. Uh, and in the end, uh, be, be just assure Kim Jong Un that his strategy it will not be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> You're back, Dr. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General Kaler, uh, I represent the 4th District of Louisiana, which is the uh, home of Barksdale Air Force Base and Global Strike Command, and I want to thank you both uh, for appearing before us today. Um, I'm very much uh, sold on the idea of nuclear deterrence and also on nuclear security. and. Uh, I want to point out that in the FY13 National Defense Authorization Act, Congress added language addressing the issue of nuclear weapon storage areas, WSAs, and quotes the 2008 SecDev Task Force on DOD Nuclear Weapons Management, which concluded, and I quote, the closure of WSA at one of the bomber bases was a significant mistake with a negative operational impact, end quote. As it stands now with the closure of the Barksdale WSA in 2007, we have a single point of failure in the Alcom mission. And just to kind of expand a little bit, as you, understand, as you know, if we have all of our Alcoms in one location, uh, and for whatever reason we have to gear up for um, battle at some point or maybe a higher level of alert, then obviously other nations can monitor our bombers going and picking up the outcomes from another location. It takes a little bit of the surprise effect away, and certainly um, it's important that we keep, um, again, nuclear assurance. So I, I just wanted to get your response. Uh, I know that a lot of this is driven by budget issues. Uh, we're talking about anywhere from 80 to $200 million uh, going forward, uh, if you include not just the standards that have to be brought to bear on the WSA site, but also the employment and other, um, I guess, device expenses. So what, what is your response? Is this something that we're going to be able to stand up uh, at some point, maybe when we get past sequestration? Sir, I think that um, it's something for us to go look at as time passes. I think uh, particularly as we go forward and uh, we begin to see a long-range strike platform uh, come into being. I think where and how we base that, uh, how we would support the dual-capable nature of that platform, just like we do with the B-52s today. Uh, we made some decisions about how to support the dual-capable nature of those B-52s. I think there are, there are many questions for us to ask and, and that we will have to answer as we go forward. Uh, today, uh, as you say, that would be a very expensive proposition uh, mm -hmm. to try to uh, go back and, and uh, revisit. However, I can say that uh, the Commander of Global Strike Command and I have just met to discuss nuclear security. Yeah. And uh, I know he has in his mind uh, a, a review of, of uh, that and the other uh, storage areas 
because as we go forward, I think we, we recognize there's some investment that's going to have to be made to keep up to date with security standards and, and other things. Uh, I can tell you we're, I, I think security-wise, um, we're in far better condition today than we were just a few years ago. But I think as we go forward to make additional security enhancements, it will be an opportunity for us to come back and take a hard look. Right. And maybe to follow up and expand that a little bit more, does the Air Force and the Department of Defense remain committed to a nuclear triad as effective deterrence? Um, you know, the, the, you, you just mentioned the long-range um, strike fighter platform uh, that will eventually replace the B-52. There may be some that are critical of that, uh, and certainly we followed that closely. B-52s, at some point in time, will be too old to fly. Now, they may be a century old before that happens. And, and as you know, General, they are doing an outstanding job as they are, but someday they're just simply going to wear out. Are we still committed to that nuclear triad and to the newer platform? I am certainly committed to the nuclear triad. Strategic Command's uh, position is that we are committed. Uh, I've seen... Uh, uh, certainly, I heard Secretary Panetta say more than once that, that the department was committed. I've seen uh, some written uh, commitment to that effect from Secretary Hagel. Uh, it was the recommendation of the Nuclear Posture Review uh, to sustain a triad, and that would certainly be my, uh, my position going forward. I think much like every other item that will be on the table as a result of fiscal issues, I suspect that that will get looked at again, but I can yeah. tell you my, my view is we ought to continue with that. Re regarding the replacement, uh, one of the enduring advantages of uh, the United States uh, is that we have the ability to project power. And, Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Time has expired. Lots of reasons for that. The long-range air piece is a big mm -hmm. part of that. Thank you, General. Mr. Langman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. and. Uh, Thank you, General Kaler and Admiral Locklear, uh, for appearing before the committee today. And uh, I certainly appreciate your service, and I also appreciate uh, having the benefit of your insight uh, and experience as we attempt to navigate our policy and, and budgetary challenges. General Kaler, if I could start with you, uh, turning to one of my uh, favorite subjects, uh, cyber. Um, General, with the, the complex demands of, of operating in cyberspace, it's certainly uh, no uh, surprise that U.S. Cyber Command has expressed the need to, uh, to increase the number of its cyber professionals uh, as recently announced. Um, however, I'm, I'm also given to understand that the situation is not as simple as adding more people, uh, that instead they'll be uh, reallocated within the service components. What progress has been made in acquiring these professionals? What training will they require? Uh, and how will they be allocated, allocated across the services? And what is STRATCOM's role specifically in shaping this force and in advocating for uh, the resources needed. Sir, let me start with the last piece first. Uh, the uh, responsibilities to protect the Department of Defense's networks uh, and to be prepared for activity in cyberspace remain assigned to strategic command uh, to include advocacy, uh, to include um, our uh, responsibility to make sure that the services are providing us with adequately trained and, and resourced uh, sufficient capacity and capability, if you will. Uh, I delegate most of those responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis to the commander of U.S. Cyber Command, General Alexander, who executes, he's the execution arm, if you will, of this, and of course, as you know, his command has been growing. Um, this is a growth area, I believe, for the department as we look to the future. Uh, I'll get you the specifics for the record in terms of the number of people that we have added here in the near term. What we have finally done is we have come to grips with how to describe uh, how we would grow the cyber capacity and capability. If this was uh, F-16 squadrons, uh, we, would, we would know how to do that. Uh, we would have a model for how to do that. We finally put something in place for cyberspace as well. So we can now come back into the resource allocation process and advocate for the amount of resources that we need. I think that part of it is going well. The question will be, with budget reductions, is how successful we will be. And I think uh, that's an open question, we'll have to see how that goes as time passes. But in my view, anyway, cyberspace is such an important part of, of our 
national security and, and our economic well-being and our ability to conduct uh, business. As you know, the bulk of cyberspace exists in the civil domain. Uh, I think that uh, having said that, though, its use for national security purposes is critical, and it is important that we do uh, everything we can to grow the capacity and capability we need to make sure that we can operate there effectively. Thank you. Admiral, let me turn to you. Um, can you discuss, uh, discuss the role that cyber operations play in your activities, particularly uh, information operations programs and how they factor into your partnership activities in the Pacific? Do you feel that your command is adequately resourced in cyber uh, in order to remain resilient in full-spectrum conflict? And then the second question I had for you, uh, and if you could probably start with this one first, I continue to be concerned about the capabilities of our bases to withstand a uh, cyber attack directed against uh, outside supporting infrastructure such as the electric grid, which is owned and operated by the private sector, but you don't have any responsibility or a capability to to defend that that uh, that private network, um, your your our bases are dependent on them. Your predecessor, Admiral Will, testified on this topic last March. Can you update us on the progress that has been made in evaluating the ability of our bases uh, in the PACOM AOR to operate and recover in the event uh, of such an attack, as well as any uh, mitigation members that are underway? Well, you know, the cyber domain is the only man-made man domain that we have. The maritime space and others are given to us. This one we created. Um, and sometimes, sometimes we tend to think of cyber as only what shows up at the end of our, our, our computer device in our hand. But reality is there's a large uh, supporting infrastructure that supports cyber globally, uh, not, not the least of which is under under seabed cables, which are prolific throughout the world that have to be understood where they are and how those are protected. So to the question of what we've done in the last year to look at our ability to operate our cyber networks, assuming that the infrastructure and those those cable networks, those things are, are secure, which is one of the things I have to worry about. Um, from the defense perspective, from my ability to operate as a and to operate the forces I have. I have, I feel uh, relatively secure that we can defend the networks that we actually would do war fighting or contingency operations on. But we are working hard at it. And Cyber Command's uh, agreement to, to grow and to provide experts and allow us to know how to do computer network defense, how to recognize computer network attack, these are all important and they're critically important uh, to me in, in the PACOM, uh, PACOM AOR. Uh, I know my time is expired, Admiral. If you could, though, in writing, respond to what we've done to protect our, in terms of being able to be resilient on our bases. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, I didn't hear you that your time had expired. What what were you requesting? They, the Admiral didn't quite answer my question in terms of what's been done in terms of okay. guaranteeing resilience. Could you please respond uh, for the record? Can I provide it to him? I'll provide your written answer to it. Will that be adequate? That would be adequate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Heck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Locklear, what transnational terrorist threats are of the greatest concern to you in the PACOM AOR, and how are you engaging with our international partners to address the terrorism threat in Southeast Asia, and how will the current fiscal constraints impact that engagement? Right. Well, as you look globally at, uh, at terrorist threats and violent extremist organizations, um, um, they are um, increasingly kind of popping out in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, and uh, whether they are in the south of the Philippines or in other areas, the, the, the vastness of the region and the, the way that it is uh, structured, I think, allows the opportunity for, if not monitored properly, to, to, uh, to be a proliferation, proliferation area for, for terrorists. Um, now, uh, but that's not the only threats. Uh, the, the, we know that Southeast Asia is the number one supplier of precursors for uh, methamphetamines that are created in, in drug labs inside, this, inside the United States. So we have a, a GIATF uh, West that works for me, and we do a large network of looking and interdicting and understanding networks that, that provide these what would appear to be innocuous chemicals that show up on, on ships, that show up in our ports and harbors, that eventually show up in in garages and people's houses that are making illegal methamphetamines that are being 
now I think the probably the, one of the number one scourges of parts of our society. Um, so th this, the next thing is uh, that I would say is, is fairly prolific in this region is, is uh, the, the human slave trade uh, that has to be contended with. I'm told that last year alone the, the human slave trade was worth about $30 billion globally, $30 billion. That's as much as I think Nike, Google, and uh, Starbucks put together. Uh, and so uh, the, looking not only at how do you stop that, but what are the networks that are benefiting by this type of unbelievable behavior that adds to the sense of lack of security in areas where we have a lot of national interest uh, is a priority for us at, at PACOM. So those are the, the, the ways we look at it. Uh, now, you can't, the area is too big to interdict all this stuff. You, you, if you're taking interdiction mentality, you'd run out of resources in, in, in a very short period of time. So what we have to do is we have to, through our, our partnership building, through our interagency processes, where we go in with the FBI or we go in with AID or we go in with, uh, with uh, um, CIA or, or other interagencies, and we work with these nations to let them, first of all, understand what's happening to them, what they're, what, to let them be able to sense what's happening, and then for them, to help them hopefully build partnership organizations or organizational structures inside their own militaries and their own governments that allow them to deal with this in an effective way. And I think we're having some great, great progress um, throughout, uh, throughout the Asia Pacific. Well, can you address the last piece, the current fiscal constraints? What's that going to do to your ability to have an impact on those three areas? Well, I mean, just just recently, my Jayadev West organization took about a 20 percent reduction in their operating costs just in the just in this year. So that's the organization that drives all of this discussions. It's, it is predominantly a civilian-led government, civilian-led organization. So the ones that are left, uh, they'll be working four days out of the week. So it it's compounds these problems in ways I think that aren't always apparent to people talk about sequestration. It, General Keeler. Um, I've got about a minute and a half left. I see we are seeing some increased threats to our space-based capabilities. What's STRATCOM doing to monitor our space capabilities against disruption of service and other threats, uh, and how are we postured to respond to these threats? Congressman, over the last year, we've done a lot to improve our plans and to address our resilience so that we can continue to um, uh, deter uh, such attacks. But you're right. We see the uh, potential for those kinds of activities in space or directed against space objects uh, growing as time passes. Space is no longer an operational sanctuary uh, for the United States, certainly, and uh, we are dealing with that through uh, improved plans, uh, our uh, improved ability to monitor what's happening, and ultimately we need to transition from uh, monitoring uh, and building a catalog of, of items that are there to getting to real-time situational awareness like we would have in the air, for example. So we still have a lot to do. Uh, there, there could be investment impacts there as time passes, but uh, how we uh, process uh, sensor information about what's happening in space and how we maintain global awareness and situational awareness in space is going to be critical as we go to the future. Uh, how we plan then to improve our resilience, I think, will be equally important. Thank you. Ms. Bordallo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Smith. And thank you, General and Admiral, for your time this morning. I uh, especially appreciate Admiral Locklear. I appreciate your opening comments. And thank you for reminding the committee about the vastness of the Pacific Ocean and the strategic importance of the U.S. territory of Guam. Admiral, I'm particularly interested to hear your views on the rebalance of forces in the Pacific. Can you address some of your challenges regarding the distributed laydown of Marines in the Pacific, how the current budget outlook may affect the timing of this plan? And I do hope that PACOM continues to prioritize our investments and realignments in the Pacific. Well, thank you. Uh, as I said earlier, I think we have a, a good plan. I think it's one that it certainly makes sense in the context of where we'd want the Marines laid down for the 21st century in, in the AOR. Guam is a center is a centerpiece of that. I mean, if if Hawaii is kind of the the front door to the Asia Pacific, Guam is well into the the, the heart of the the living room. All it takes is just a quick look at a at a the vastness of the region and a and a and a map, and you can see why we would want to make sure that we optimize 
our capabilities both in peace and in crisis from Guam, uh, and that bringing this part of the Marines back there is a critical piece of that. So the, the challenges to it are ensuring it, 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 it's, a, it's a little bit of a house of, uh, of cards. You have to move one thing before you do the next. So ensuring that we can move ahead with the, the changes that we need to, to be funded in, in Okinawa to be able to allow the, the, the movement of those Marines in a time frame that allows us to have the infrastructure that's needed to be uh, constructed on Guam. Um, and we've, uh, uh, quite frankly, I think we've, we've, we've had some struggle in trying to get, that, get those funds uh, released, and I'm hopeful that, that in the coming uh, uh, weeks and months that that will, will uh, be in our favor. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral. I would also like to ask about bilateral and multilateral military training exercises uh, in your AOR. I understand that the current budget will place constraints on training and joint exercises, but in a more ideal fiscal situation, what would you like to see with regard to multilateral training in the Pacific? I fear that we have a lot of bilateral training exercises that could be better leveraged through our multilateral training. And also, if you could please address how you intend to provide effective training in a more cost-efficient manner given DOD's budget constraints. Well, you know, at the, after the World War II, we basically had a bilateral relationship structure, uh, kind of a hub-and-spoke structure uh, for U.S. with U.S. allies and U.S. partners that served us quite well for many decades. Uh, but str the strategic landscape has shifted to some degree now, and the importance of multilaterals, uh, I think, is growing uh, uh, day by day. Uh, the importance of multilaterals is that you get a, a, a larger group of like-minded people working on uh, problems that all matter to them. Uh, you build improved interoperability between multilaterals instead of bilaterals. Uh, you get a, in a very vast and un, uncertain region, you get a much better intelligence and, and picture of what's going on if you have multi, multiple, multiple countries participating in that because they all have a little bit different view than, than, than uh, we may have from Hawaii or we may have from Washington. So we are pursuing multilaterals. We're uh, very supportive of, uh, of ASEAN, the East Asia Summit, and those multilateral forums. Uh, even with our own allies, we're pursuing more uh, trilateral operations uh, where we can between Japan, the U.S., and, and, uh, and Korea, uh, Japan, the U.S., and Australia. Uh, just pick, pick one. But we're moving in the direction of multilateralism. And you can, uh, you really, in fact, if you take the Rim of the Pacific exercise, which is the largest maritime exercise in the world, it's a multinational exercise. I think last year 22 nations participated. Russia came with ships for the first time. It was a great success. Uh, we invited the Chinese, the, PL, PR, the PLA, to send ships in 2014, and we're hopeful that they will come and participate. But in those, we get to know each other better. We get to operate together. We get a common understanding. And when you have militaries that can operate and understand each other, it lowers your threshold of crisis, uh, no matter how you cut it. it it's a good, good thing for all of our security and our own national security. Now, how can we be more effective in our training? Uh, one is to ensure that the bilateral training we do is, is effective for the strengthening of the alliance, uh, but that where we can leverage that bilateral training into multilateral, that we take those opportunities, and we're doing that. Uh, we also have to make sure that our range systems, of which we actually uh, conduct our operations, our training operations, uh, are unencumbered, remain un unencumbered. Encroachment is one of our, the biggest problems we have everywhere in the world today where sometimes it gets too hard to do operations because there's just too big of a population growth area or environmental concerns. So our ranges in the Pacific Northwest are critical. Our ranges around uh, Hawaii that we've already talked about are critical. Uh, the opportunity to find additional range space in your part of the world, I think, will be important. Thank you very much, Admiral, for your continued interest in our area. And thank you, General. I yield back. That's it. Thank you very much for your service. Uh, please convey our thanks to those under your command, the men and women that, uh, that are serving. Thank you very much. This committee stands adjourned.